All right, hello, good evening. My name is Luke Savage. Uh, I will be your moderator for tonight's event. Uh, this evening, we're going to have the privilege of hearing from two remarkable scholars, Drs. Uh, Stephanie Ross and Larry Savage, about their new book, uh, which is on sale at the back uh, in paperback. Uh, the paperback, I want to say, is exclusive to these in person events. So uh, this is a good time to pick it up, just saying. Um, I have a few quick notes, just a few items of business about tonight's event, and then we'll get going. Um, in the first part, I'm going to ask Stephanie, uh, Stephanie and Larry some questions about the book and the issues it raises. Um, that shouldn't take too long. And then in part two, um, they will take questions from all of you. Um, we want to thank, of course, our host for tonight's event, uh, the Workers' Action Center. Um, I suppose this part won't be relevant information for most of you since you're already here, but uh, uh, if you enjoy the launch and want to see more, uh, <laughs> there will be further launches in Hamilton, uh, St. Catharines, and Windsor. Um, if you want to buy the book a second time, <laughs> buy it early, buy often, as I always say. It's a, it's a really good book tour, you know. It's, it's <laughs> cool. um, now I have just a few uh, introductory remarks I want to offer um, by way of laying the groundwork for the discussion. Um, I do want to just say first that contrary to what you might assume uh, based on our last names and initials being the same, uh, Larry has not actually invited his like little brother to come moderate the event. <laughs> We're not actually related. Um, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, there are two Canadian socialists whose initials are LS. Amazing. Um, so in any case, um, with that out of the way, um, this book offers us a very compelling and I think perhaps on the face of it anyway, a relatively straightforward narrative about uh, the history and trajectory of auto worker unionism in Canada. Um, I say on the face of it because uh, I think you'll find the analysis in shifting gears is anything but uh, reductive or simplistic. You'll find that Stephanie and Larry do not, do not fall back on road explanations or crude judgments when it comes to the various historical episodes they explore. I think that's true of their overall narrative as well. Uh, so this book charts the course of auto worker unionism in Canada and its very, various expressions, the CAW, uh, UAW, Unifor, uh, from uh, its tumultuous beginnings in the 1930s uh, through its growth into a powerful movement that advocated not only for the everyday material needs of its members, uh, but also for a wider social vision uh, through education, uh, through an activist political strategy um, that drew it into an electoral partnership with organized social democracy uh, as well. Uh, both the emergence of that relationship, so the alliance between labor and the New Democratic Party, uh, and the subsequent decline of that relationship uh, is one of the book's major themes, as is the subsequent shift of the CAW and later Unifor towards uh, a different kind of political strategy and a different identity. First towards a more syndicalist approach on the one hand, uh, but also towards uh, first closer relations with the Liberal Party, uh, and finally towards a more fluid kind of political and electoral orientation and an embrace of so-called strategic voting campaigns. Now, all of that is a pretty crude sketch I've just given you of the book. Um, throughout, Larry and Stephanie are uh, invariably using that history to pose much bigger questions, um, questions that I think uh, rarely have easy or straightforward answers. Um, you know, uh, why, for example, a particular strategic approach might be favored by a union in a given moment or at a given time, uh, why a union strongly associated with one economic sector as opposed to another uh, might be liable to embrace a particular identity, uh, why it might embrace or reject explicit partisan or ideological affiliation. Uh, those are all fundamental questions facing both uh, labor scholarship and historiography, uh, but they're also fundamental issues uh, facing uh, trade union uh, activism and practice in the present day. And uh, Stephanie and Mary, I think, offer us a very nuanced interpretive toolbox with which to think about and explore them. Um, so with all of that in mind, I'd like to start the conversation with uh, some general questions. Um, I guess, shall I stand or shall I sit? Um, <coughs> stay standing for now. Um, so I guess first, the kind of generic, like first question at a book launch, the, you know, why did you write this book, that question. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a history of auto worker unionism in Canada, but it's by no means uh, purely descriptive in its approach or analysis. Um, you know, as I said, it's all about posing these bigger questions about uh, 
um, not only the uh, you know history of auto worker unionism, but the history of the trajectory of the Canadian labor movement in general. So, um, why uh, why auto workers? Why UAW, CAW, Unifor? Why is that history such a useful tapestry for posing these bigger questions? Um, okay, well, I'll start. Thanks, Luke, and thanks everybody for coming. So amazing to see so many friends and um, comrades and also uh, people that we talked to uh, to write this book and so we're very grateful that you're here and hopefully we've done you some justice in this book um, so to to start off answering your question you know why auto workers why and, and why did we feel compelled to to write this book I guess there's you know, there's a personal answer to that and there's a kind of political and scholarly answer to that. So uh, to say about, you know, per, on the personal level, um, you know, the CAW was uh, such a uh, central actor in the time when I personally became politicized. Um, so in the 1990s in Ontario, the CAW was at the center of everything that was exciting. Um, it was at the center of the fight against the Ray government and uh, the attack on public sector workers. It was, um, you know, at, at the, the forefront of the days of action, the fight against the Harris government. It was a union whose slogan that said, fighting back makes a difference. And, it, and it, it really felt that that was real. And I think that for the generation of us and before and after who were in our 20s and that, uh, in that era, who were becoming politically engaged, who were engaged in the labor movement, um, the, the CW was a really important political reference for what kind of unionism was possible. Um, and I think it had a, an influence far beyond the walls of the union. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, stepping back and thinking about, you know, the role that auto workers have played in the history of the Canadian labor movement, it also also has been central. And you can't really do labor studies without uh, reckoning with the history of auto workers, auto worker unionism. Um, and even though I tried personally very hard not to study auto workers, I, I really tried to focus on, uh, on public sector unions. I still do do that. Um, the, it, you know, being in Canadian labor studies, there was almost like a vortex of um, being pulled, and especially when I moved to Windsor for a couple of years, you, you couldn't really be in that place and not want to try to reckon with the role that um, the CAW played in uh, the, all of the central fights of like collective bargaining, you know, social and political reform, uh, community engagement, like th they were everywhere. Um, you know, so I, I think that because the union has been so important, and we can say more about that, and we do talk about that, especially in the first chapter of the book, what has happened to it, how it has evolved, um, how it has struggled in, in, and responded to the challenges of globalization, of neoliberalism, and how that has been expressed in its search for a political strategy really matters. It matters because of the outsized impact that the union uh, has always had on the broader politics of the labor movement. So that, that's, that's what I would start with. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that this is a union that is front and center, even though it's not numerically dominant as a union. Um, uh, in the labor movement, that CAW and Unifor leaders have always been front and center in the media, household names as far as the labor movement is concerned. Um, so from that political perspective, I think the union plays a central role in labor politics, whether some segments of the labor movement like that or not. Uh, personally, for me, I, I come from an auto worker family. In fact, my father and my father-in-law were both members of Local 199 uh, in St. Catharines, and I live just a stone's throw away from the General Motors plant uh, in St. Catharines, um, and grew up around the union. This was a union that I remember when I was on the steering committee for the Days of Action in St. Catharines was the union that was behind this event. Uh, and as a student activist, remembering being invited to the local union hall to promote um, the, uh, the various campaigns that the union would try to do in conjunction uh, 
uh, with the student movement. I'm thinking specifically the boycott around Molson products uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, and this was a union that uh, I had a very soft spot for, for things that would happen over 20 years ago, like when uh, Buzz Hargrove and the CAW announced in Oshawa that they were going to come and support the, uh, an openly gay student who wanted to bring his boyfriend to a prom at a Catholic school. This was a union, not the one that you would expect that was front and center sort of making this uh, a national headline. Uh, and then, of course, in my own academic work, I've explored various um, themes that we really go in depth in on the book related to party union relationships, strategic voting, and electoral tactics. And so when this opportunity came about for Stephanie and I to collaborate on a book like this, we, of course, collaborated a lot. It, I thought it was a match made in heaven. I'm always uh, thrilled to be able to work with Stephanie, and so th we uh, we decided to take the plunge on this uh, on this book. So um, I guess let's kind of begin at the beginning. I want to ask about uh, the story you tell right at the start of the book, um, because you begin the book by describing a quite recent episode. Um, so it's you know it's 2021 November, I think. Uh, the Ontario Federation of Labor is holding its convention. Uh, at the same time, uh, Jerry Dias, who is then president of Unifor, uh, alongside Smokey Thomas of Opsu, uh, they do a press conference with Doug Ford and announce, you know, who's a few years earlier has, uh, you know, canceled a scheduled minimum wage increase, um, and they announce a surprise, you know, surprise, we're raising the, you know, Doug Ford's raising the minimum wage, um, and they did this uh, in a context where the OFL, I believe, was, uh, you know, endorsing the NDP in the lead up to the election. So. It's an interesting story. Uh, why did you open the book uh, with it? Yeah. Well, we really open with that vignette because the juxtaposition of the OFL convention sort of debating and supporting uh, the endorsement of the NDP in the provincial election uh, being what was supposed to be a big media event for the, the party and the labor movement was completely overshadowed by the fact that Diaz and Smokey Thomas were up in Milton using the backdrop of a Unifor Hall to stand at a basically a pre-election campaign event for Doug Ford, again, to announce this boost to the minimum wage that he himself had scrapped uh, a, a year earlier. And the reason it was such an important juxtaposition that really digs into the themes of the book was that, of course, it was so eyebrow raising that you would have two union leaders that for years had sort of pushed anti-conservative strategic voting now standing with the premier and essentially providing political cover uh, for a premier who would go on to win that next provincial election sort of beating the drum of uh, working for workers. It sort of lent credibility to that kind of uh, approach. It was also surprising of course in the sense that these were two union leaders who had members who were being negatively affected by Bill 124, the wage restraint legislation, uh, and who had campaigned hard against Ford and, and previous conservative leaders. And so in a way, it demonstrated just how dramatically the political terrain had shifted. Because remember, this was a union a Unifor in 2013 that sort of was a champion of anti-conservative strategic voting. But before that, uh, in the CAW days and the UAW before that had a strong uh, uh, partisan historical alliance with the NDP. And so this is a union that had shifted gears over several decades and now seemed to be sort of uh, very overtly engaging in a transactional brand of politics. Um, and so it, I think the, the opening vignette really sets the table for the rest of the book because it touches on the key themes and, uh, and provides, a, I think, what is a very compelling example of the union ships. I mean, I would just add a couple of things that, you know, what was interesting about that moment was how even though the union had been moving in a certain direction politically for some time, that incident was met by 
like universe with universal shock, both outside but inside the union too. So everybody that we talked to who had been in or close to leadership at that time, when we asked them about that incident, they were nonplussed or they had perhaps more salty things to say about it. Um, and either t complete confusion or um, you know very critical that this was pragmatism gone too far. But I think why it's an important vignette is that it does, and since then, in events that happened since we finished the book, it does show a much wider embrace of that kind of pragmatic politics that we associate with Gomperism, with with the you know the politics of of Samuel Gompers, the American Federation of Labor, where you reward friends and punish enemies. And you do that in order to make transactional <coughs> politics deliver the goods politically for your members. Um, and I mean, it would be unfair to say that CAW or Unifor is the only union that does that. I mean, th there are many unions that adopt this political strategy, even while they also um, do other kinds of um, uh, politics in other kinds of ways. So this isn't a this isn't a unique thing uh, for for Unifor to have done this, but I think that the distance that it traveled from a a much a, a kind of politics that was much more grounded in a a class analysis, uh, a commitment to social unionism, and to try to balance sectional interests with the with the more general interest, seems to have at that point faded in the background. Um, and I think that there have been things that have, ha that things that have happened since that show that this trend has continued. Um, and that, in fact, collaborations with the Ford government have not since been met with the same level of shock. Um, so I think that that's why it's a really important way to start the book. So, um, yeah, maybe I can uh, pull up this thread some more and uh, ask you about sort of the, the, the prehistory uh, of, that, of that incident, you know, the, the, the trajectory over the many decades that preceded that. Um, you, know, the, the, you know, the concept of shifting gears, you know, you apply it in a number of different uh, areas, but one is just, and it's relevant to what both of you were just saying, is the electoral arena. So, um, you know, can you talk about, uh, can, can you lay out that history a little more from this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of a symbiosis between, uh, you know, labor and, and social democracy towards this more transactional approach you're describing. What's the history there? Sure. Well, I mean, the, the auto workers union played a key role in uh, funding the development of the new party, the, the NDP, and, um, you know, have had uh, strong partisan relationships with key leaders in the union also playing roles at, in key elected positions within the party apparatus. Uh, you know, of in the early days of the NDP, really auto workers, steel workers, and a couple other unions sustained uh, the party. And there were key leaders in UAW history, like Dennis McDermott, who were very strong uh, champions uh, and partisan champions for the party. And so uh, we talk in the, in the book about how some of the union's education structure was geared towards this partisan alliance to the NDP, but what's important, I think that we also demonstrate is that the union never just uncritically um, farmed out its politics to the NDP. It always preserved its own independent political views while sustaining this partnership uh, with the NDP, and so it's not that they never disagreed with the party, or that uh, you know they they uh, they didn't have qualms about policy issues, but the union very much understood the NDP as its party or the labor movement's party through that sort of ideological uh, social democratic connection, uh, and uh, and the influence of labor within the party. I think often people think about labor's influence within social democratics being a left-wing um, influence. It's a little more complicated than that. The sort of, sort of auto workers, I think, generally had, were a left-wing influence within the party, but the, the, the leadership of the auto worker union also kind of worked with the leadership of the party to quash the, the waffle movement within the party. Uh, and so it is a complicated history. 
But I think there are a series of key events that really um, start to weaken that partisan link between the party uh, and the union. Uh, I think the 1988 free trade election is one of these watershed moments that we talk about in the book where the union is very disappointed in how the party uh, downplays free trade uh, as an issue and is openly critical of the party's leadership. Again, that bends but doesn't break the relationship. We then see in Ontario with the Ray government being elected that there's this sudden jubilation and then Disappointment follows very quickly when we see things like uh, the social contract, which was uh, a public sector wage restraint, and uh, the CAW being the private sector union not directly affected by the legislation, coming out very strongly in support of the public sector union alliance fighting the social contract, and the union being far more critical of the party, now starting to pull donations from the party, uh, and uh, this crisis of social democracy, uh, which kind of, in a way, o helps open the door to the Harris government and this hyper neoliberalism. The, the uh, auto workers sit out that election, they don't endorse uh, the NDP, and then the Harris government comes in uh, with the neoliberal restructuring, the anti union labor reforms, which basically creates this ad hoc crisis that forces the union back into the electoral arena, but not into the arms of the NDP. Instead, as a response to an ad hoc crisis, we see auto workers deciding to strategically pivot and embrace anti-conservative strategic voting as a tactic to block uh, the worst uh, aspects of, of neoliberal restructuring. And that really, I think, starts to transform that relationship because auto workers never really come back to the NDP. Uh, and uh, there is sort of a, a break that is justified as a left-wing break, but if we look back historically, even though it's framed as a left-wing break, we see uh, the, definitely the, the NDP shifting to the center, but also the union shifting to the center politically in these ad hoc alliances with the Liberal Party. And of course, I know Stephanie's gonna talk about this, but none of this is divorced about what's happening in the workplace and in the economy more generally, those pressures are also helping to reshape uh, or shift this landscape of labor politics. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you give it well, I just want to add a couple of things. One is that, like, to highlight, like, the point that you made about, you know, social democracy or the relationship to the NDP not being, like, the sum total of the union's politics, and that was something that um, was a, a, a very strong message that we received, uh, and which is evident in the fact that you know the part the the, the the relationship to the party was always like maybe one of a sympathetic critic like there was always some critical relationship and there was a lot more political diversity in the union than uh, a partisan tie would imply and there's a lot of people in this room who were part of that uh, political diversity in the union actually um, and and fighting for different kinds of politics for the union um, but it is interesting how even though the the NDP in some way is itself moving to the center and it's creating a crisis for the union, the, 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 the distancing of the union and the party and then the break after 2006 in some ways um, unanchors the union politically. Like even if we want to be critical of social democracy and where, where it's gone, there's a way in which that break seems to lead to the union becoming kind of politically free floating. Um, there's, no, there's no grounding in a social democratic project anymore. Um, there's no um, necessary encounter with other unions in the context of the party, other sectors. That's not to say that Unifor can, doesn't continue to think about its relationship to other sectors of the working class, whatever, but there's something structural about the the space of the party as a way for like the particular and the general to kind of be negotiated, right? And there, I, I think that after 2006, once they formally disaffiliate, there is a way in which that anchor isn't there anymore. And then the, the politics of the union start to drift into a more as we say, transactional or 
uh, sectional direction. And there, there is a period in, in there before 2006 where the union is trying to figure out where to go. Does it go further to the left? Um, and so we do see a, attempts to go further to the left, engage in street politics, flying pickets, uh, relationships with the, the global justice movement and um, you know the, 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 the turn to extra parliamentary politics. Um, and for various historical reasons, that becomes block, blocked in 2001, we, as we all know, that those kinds of politics become much more difficult to practice. Um, and you know, the, the feeling, uh, the assessment of how the days of action as like a really important expression of street politics is one that does not lead the union to think, oh, we should put more eggs in that basket. Right? I mean, the days of action achieved certain kinds of things, but in the end, it didn't achieve its goal to stop the Harris agenda. And whether or not it's a simple, I, I think it's in somewhat a simplistic analysis to say, oh, well, then that as a work. Nonetheless, there was a lesson learned that that form of politics isn't going to deliver the kind of policy or politics that we want. And so the union continues to, to search and it settles on strategic voting. And then I think what we really try to do in the book is show the evolution of strategic voting from initially an anti-neoliberal, anti-conservative strategy of like trying to mitigate or prevent the worst damage from happening to one that actually evolves into a direction of how can we elect people with that will have a chance to be in government with whom we will have relationships of influence? And this is where the, the door to the liberal starts to open. And then, it, then the question becomes now, strategically, how, how open is that door? How wide open is that door? If there are parties that are not the NDP or the liberals who are willing to deliver policy that the union wants, what does that mean to the kind of positioning that the union is going to think about in coming elections? So uh, I just have one more question before we get to the uh, questions from all of you. Um, I guess this is the kind of like the what is to be done question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, so I want to kind of, I guess, tee up the question by reading a little bit from the concluding chapter of the book. Um, I think. Uh, you know this this part gets uh, you know pretty close to the uh, you know direct editorial uh, you know uh, a statement of the book's thesis. Uh, the two of you write, uh, although the creation of Unifor in 2013 was presented by its architects as a game changer for the labor movement and for labor politics more generally, the union has more or less spun its wheels during its first decade. The threats that precipitated Unifor's formation still hang over Canada's unions. A much touted independent and progressive approach to labor politics has lost ground to a sectionalist and transactional brand of nonpartisanship that sometimes has more in common with the politics of Samuel Gompers than it does with the politics of Walter Ruther. On occasion, Unifor seem seemingly has closer relations with political power holders and employers than with the rest of the labor movement. These relations have created an environment where the union's values, principles, and capacity to act independently from capital have been compromised. Uh, this dynamic is reflected in the union's defense of industry subsidies, its trumpeting of competitiveness arguments, and its willingness to play ball with anti-union politicians and governments in the hopes of securing a short-term policy win or investment. Um, so that's, that's a little bleak, but you do a few paragraphs later, <laughs> do a few paragraphs later, end the book on a more hopeful note, uh, I promise. Uh, writing, uh, the union has shifted gears before and it can do so again. So um, yeah, what does the you know, road ahead here look like? What is to be done? Great. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, that's, of course, the question that we will want the answer to, and uh, you, you probably won't get it, even if you buy, very generously buy the book. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's a, what we try to do in the book is actually lay out in the final chapter the way that different people that we talk to see the future and try to kind of sketch out, okay, you know, there are people who are fighting for this version and for this direction. Um, I mean, I think that there are, very, there are people in the union who 
who are very comfortable with the current direction of the union and who think that the union should double down on it. Um, uh, so, you know, in that it is delivering policy. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the debate around electric vehicles, the debate, you know, the, the, the lobbying around subsidies for um, investments in the auto industry, um, and the, the relative success of the union in securing some of those things, even though it remains to be seen if those jobs actually get created and sustained, um, is nonetheless evidence that those folks would point to. But I think that for us, like gomperism, this kind of sort of gomperist political calculus, it works, but it doesn't work for everybody. It, it really only can work for some people. And so in, in the sense that if we notice, like, in particular, who in the working class, the conservative parties of the, of the current moment are willing to partner with and willing to deliver policy to, it's a very particular idea of the working class. It's a very uh, small slice. Uh, of blue collar male industrial construction workers. Um, and there's all kinds of people, uh, the folks who are, you know, by and large involved in caring for people, providing for public services, you know, doing all the, really the essential work that made it possible for us to survive the last five years. Those people aren't really in that vision. And so in making a decision to uh, double down on the gomperist transactional strategy, we leave all of these other folks behind. And it, it, it just shows the contradiction that's at the heart of the union right now because those folks are also in Unifor's ambit, right? Those are all also people who are part of, or some of them at least, are part of Unifor's membership. The other option is double to go back to the NDP. But I think we explore how that isn't necessarily an easily uh, recommended strategy because the things that led the, the union to leave the NDP really have not been solved or addressed or, or changed. The, the, the NDP itself is also in a political kind of crisis or looking for a political direction and it isn't clear that just re-engaging with them is a solution. So I think really what we end on is to say that that the only way forward for, for, for unions is an embrace of a, of a, a more a class-based and socialist analysis that's at the core of the way the union thinks about its, its, its role and a major investment in turning, in organizing people uh, inside the union, not just the activist layer um, and that that only that is actually going to create the kind of forms of power and in, internal debate and discussion that is going to allow the union to have the power that it lost and has lost economically and politically over the last 20 years. Um, but I mean, it's easy to say that. It's much more difficult sure. to do it. I, I mean, I think it, in the way that we write the concluding chapter where we really position various people that we interviewed in conversation with one another uh, because we canvass the various political paths that are available to, to the union, I think one thing that we draw out that is not specific to Unifor, but I think could be applied to unions more generally, um, is the lack of political education that could bring people to a particular place to embrace a kind of, the kind of politics that Stephanie was describing and this problem that exists in all unions where unions talk big about mobilization but they do it without first having done an effective job at organizing their members, right? Uh, if we have a very small layer of the union's activist membership who are engaged and we push for mobilization, we get 10 people out, right? We get 20 people out. So this investment in a combination of political education with member organizing could really increase the capacity for a union to be effective at actually mobilizing its membership politically as a, as a first step, no matter which direction the union uh, decides that it wants to pursue, that could actually magnify its political power. But I'd say that if you want to do something politically ambitious, in particular, you need that. Like, 
you, you can't, you can do some forms of politics and be successful with not a lot of people involved. Sure, sure. But if you want to do something that's really ambitious, that it that goes against the political mainstream, then what what we're what we're talking about is essential. And so then the question is whether or not this union or any union feels that what it is uh, what it wants to get is other if they feel that what they want is worth organizing for in that that deep and, and broad way. Um, or whether or not they're going to satisfy. So, you know, they're going to they're going to try to get small wins, small reforms, and that's going to just keep the lights on. Um, uh, and, and and whether or not that kind of approach is going to be enough. Um, and I think that's the that's the decision that that Unifor has to make. But it's also the decision that unions all across the labor movement have to make. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I think that's a good moment to open the floor to questions. Those are all kind of related questions, yeah. so why don't we take those? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Mark's question, which I appreciate you asking, because it is, a, it is an important part of our analysis. Like, we really do try to understand the relationship between the changing economic environment in auto and how that creates both a shift in their attitude towards collective bargaining and the and the strategies and tactics they're willing to deploy in that realm, and how that maps onto their political strategies and choices. So, you know, like I think it's it's fair to say that the union, the union's militancy and collective bargaining, was based upon, you know, a certain kind of structural power that they had. That was backed up by the existence of the Auto Pact, and that that while that's not the whole story, it was a big part of of why it was possible to, you know, in the early '80s, say no to concessions when the Americans were saying yes, and to uh, because there was a sense that these jobs were going to by and large stay here because of the. The, the way in which the auto pack required production in Canada in order to sell in Canada by the, the, the Detroit Three. And, you know, the loss of the auto pack in 2001 is really crucial to, as a changing external environment, not just for co collective bargaining, but also for politics. So for, for us, I think the connections are that, you know, after 2001, there's just so much more vulnerability around job loss. And so if you don't think that the jobs will stay, it becomes very hard to strike. And increasingly, I think the union moves towards a view that they have to partner with the employers in, in important ways to go to government for subsidies. And I mean, that was said to me in Windsor. It was said to me by a, a, an, an auto worker leader when, because uh, I participated in something that I wrote about in another article. I, I, yeah, exactly. I participated in Manufacturing Matters Coalition locally. And in the debate around, at that coalition table, around what kind of tactics the, the, co the community coalition should take on, it was very clear that we were not doing a demonstration or a rally or a protest. It was, it, was a, it was a march, it was a parade, it was a demonstration of community support for manufacturing, but it was not meant to be targeted at the employers because the employers are the ones that bring the jobs. And so to me, I, I felt like that, that symbolized for me the, the, the strategic thinking around how the union uh, engages in workplace militancy. It's kind of off the table. So if you have a, a strategy that is now premised on um, saving jobs through partnership with management by going to government for supportive policy, you don't want to piss those employers off. 
but you also need a partner in, pol in, in the political realm that's going to deliver. And remember, at this time, the Harper government is in, is in power. And they were almost uniquely uninterested in uh, talking to the union, in, in delivering any kind of policy to the union. And so this is where I think the, the, the union's political strategy electorally starts to change away from ABC, although obviously they want to get rid of the conservatives. They also want a, a willing partner. And so that means creating certain kinds of electoral alliances. And that's especially evident in Windsor. And we talk a lot about how the, the relationship between the CW and the Liberal Party in Windsor is, is quite strong because there is a sense that um, good relationships with those people who might be cabinet ministers, et cetera, is going to deliver policy for the auto sector. So you see a shift away from the, the structural, using structural power in the workplace to using institutional power in the political realm and not wanting not wanting militancy to disturb all of the, the alliances that are making that political strategy possible. So in short, I think that that is sort of what we're what we're sketching out here. Um, let me weigh in on this question about uh, where's the left. It was interesting because we interviewed for the book uh, three former national presidents of the union, and I think Stephanie would agree that they would all insist they they were the left, right? They are the left. Um, and it was interesting talking to people who would kind of push against the leadership uh, from the left, who would recount uh, sort of being hammered by the leadership on the basis that they felt their their analysis of the situation was that these leaders couldn't let a left take hold within the union because then it threatened uh, their power. Of course, the top-down structure, the, the high level of centralization in the union, the punishing power of the national president, the ability of the national president to kind of bring people onto staff in order to, to quiet them, I think also plays a role here. One of the reasons I think some of the leaders of the union, whether you buy it or not, could command this sort of title of being the left is that they saw themselves in opposition to the UAW leadership south of the border because of history and they could cast them as sort of right wing and and sort of the coast on the history of the breakaway to justify being a different kind of union uh, and a left union. But this question of, about why we haven't seen a kind of significant internal left grow within the union is an interesting one. But I feel like it can't be detached from the fact that the left in general is just not strong, is not present. And to have a strong labor left politics, you need a strong left. Uh, and I think that without that strong left current, th these are people who are kind of left, in some cases, at sitting ducks within their own unions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that that has a role to play, although be, I'd be interested in hearing from some rank and file uniform members about that dynamic, and, uh, because we haven't seen that same uh, level of activity that, we, that we've seen in the UAW, for example. Uh, and I think that is an interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. But I think you are right, Sarah. I think there are me lots of members in the union that want something more, but they're not they're isolated, they're fragmented, there's, they're, they can say no, as we, I think we saw in you know, bargaining last year where you've got Ford workers saying, almost rejecting a historically good collective agreement. Um, I think that's an expression of uh, a certain kind of uh, set of expectations that have been heightened and were not being met, not just in terms of the dollars and cents, but in terms of like the desire to be fighting for your agreement and to be uh, at the leading edge again and being a, a union for whom fighting back makes a difference and all of that. Um, so I think that is there, but, um, but there, isn't, there isn't much inside or outside the union that could bring those people together and, 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 or, and give them some kind of collective impact and, and voice and direction, it's true. Okay, so we just need to rebuild a powerful mass uh, mass mobilized lab. No problem. Sounds simple enough. Yep. Um, okay, up, up here yeah. close first. Uh
Um, maybe I'll start with Stefan with your question. I mean, you know, this is the other thing that the CAW and Unifor does very uniquely, which is that it has a very extensive paid educational leave program that uh, is mostly cited in the Detroit Three because it's, there's collective agreements, but it, there's a, you know, they have a huge education infrastructure. I mean, you know, Herman is here, you can talk about it at length. Um, and that still exists, right? That, like, that there's, you know, residential, basically forms of labor studies that go on that I think historically were quite politically radical in many respects that were uh, uh, offering um, a political education that was rooted in a class analysis. Um, but I think that, and, and, and lots of that still exists, but I, and I mean, I can't speak to like what the curriculum is now at Pell. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, this is something that, that Sam has said many times is that when you, you have education but you don't have struggle, then those ideas and tools don't really go anywhere. Um, and so they get diverted, and I, I did see this in Windsor, they get diverted into other kinds of causes. Um, good things, but forms of, you know, community charity, um, that, you know, people become activists in other realms because there really isn't a form of activism that's available to them that rises to the, the level of the political education going on. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's clear that the messages in, in Pell were very much like, understanding neoliberalism and capitalism and, and so forth, but you don't have an actual vehicle for uh, or political strategy that allows you to fight those things, they, they kind of become a bit diffuse. And I would add that, you know, I think that some of the changes around how people access Pell are important too, like going to paid educational leave is a, is a goodie, right? And so then it becomes part of the mechanisms of um, rewards and punishments inside the union. Um, and so, you know, who gets to go to Pell is a political question, um, increasingly, I would say. And that, that has an impact, right? And if, if, if Pell used to require that at the end of their four weeks you sign an NDP card, which many people testified to uh, in, in, this, in our interviews, uh, now that's not the case. I'm not sure what it is that you sign on to when you graduate from Pell. Um, maybe going to a lobbying day or something, right? Um, so it isn't that there isn't political education. It isn't that it it isn't useful and interesting, but it's sort of detached, I think, from any uh, of the kind of politics that we're talking about. You, it, it is really more involving people in fairly mainstream institutionalized forms of politics. I would. I don't know if that answers entirely your question, but like, it really goes back to what Sarah says they're, it's, they're doing political education, of, but of a very particular kind, and it isn't nece it isn't necessarily um, attached to a strategy that would develop people's capacities in the way that we're we're talking about. I don't know if that's fair, but I'll, I'll just jump around a little bit based on some of the issues people raised. Th this question about a one member, one vote is an interesting one. As part of the research for the book, I, I attended the Unifor convention that Lana Payne won. They actually had a, debated a resolution on one member, one vote at the convention. No delegates spoke to it. Uh, there were only 17% of members uh, who supported it, supported it based on they have a weighted voting system at the convention. There was clearly no strong drive to push one member one vote, and of course both of the leading candidates weren't supportive uh, of that. But even at this convention, which was very different in the sense that it wasn't being completely controlled from the chair, which normally happens because of the political uncertainty in the union, that theoretically should have provided space for the left to organize a little better but there was really no evidence of that and there was no clear left-wing candidate for the presidency. I think some people read it backwards as if there was because <coughs> Doherty was associated with Diaz who was implicated in the scandal and, and, and Doherty himself was implicated in the scandal. But 
On the political front, there was no real difference between the candidates on politics, except for Dave Cassidy, who was the third candidate, who clearly had a strong Gomperist impulse and, and was unapologetic about it. We interview him for the book. He's very unapologetic about, uh, about that approach. So you didn't see these clear political differences between the candidates. And uh, this extends to affiliation to the CLC. Both Doherty and Lana Payne campaigned on reaffiliation to the CLC or the idea of exploring reaffiliation. But I think um, there are practical reasons that that hasn't happened yet, which is I think there's a recognition Uniform maybe doesn't need the CLC or they don't think they need the CLC. They can still count on the CLC to support them uh, when it comes to particular struggles. Uh, they can lend their support to particular struggles in other unions, but they also, uh, in the situation they have now, a free pass to raid, uh, which would become more complicated if they were to rejoin the Canadian Labor Congress. And of course, I imagine some unions might have some issues with Unifor <laughs> rejoining the Canadian Labor Congress, which is another issue altogether. On this issue of, of Poiliev and could Unifor work with a future conservative prime minister, I think one of the things that came through in the interviews is that people were very practical in the sense that they understood the union has to work with conservative governments uh, because they're there and the union sometimes has pressing public policy needs. And I think that you saw uh, that Unifor could certainly work with a conservative government in Ontario. Um, even if they strongly campaigned against that, uh, that party in a previous election. So I, I expect Unifor will go full on with an anti poliev campaign. There, there's already sort of evidence that the union is going to go in this direction, but I think the idea that they would uh, not then work with the government once would, it, it, it was in power is challenging given where the union has shifted in terms of its relationship uh, with government. And so I think when we interview Payne, the way she put it is she wants to make it toxic for any political party to do things that would be against the union's interest, which is a very different conception of the, as sort of a social democratic ideological one. And so I guess there was just the, uh, there was another thread about the uh, recent developments in the UAW, yeah. whether those could sort of spill over, have implications yeah. here. Well, I mean, I think that there's no question that the leadership change in the UAW had a huge impact on auto talks in Canada. And all of the stuff that we saw, all of the, all of the, um, even, even though the union, I think as Larry had mentioned before, it started out, um, trying to position this as a kind of a made in Canada approach. We're different, we have our own different needs, we're gonna take our own different strategies. It wasn't just they did things traditionally, like they did, we could see like they did the handshake when they, with all of the companies when they um, exchanged bargaining proposals. Um, you know, Fame very much, very self-consciously did, did not do that and did the member handshake, so went to the plants instead of going uh, of doing those photo ops with with the company CEOs in the U.S. and I think it did have an impact. I think it made the talks here much more turbulent because even if, as we were saying, the membership isn't kind of organized in a coherent way, they can get mad. They can get mad, and I think that they did express their anger. Um, and uh, although you know what was interesting also was to note that. There's different demographics in, different, in the different companies, and so the way that people orient towards this history of the CAW being a particular kind of union is different. So, you know, Ford and Stellantis have an older, uh, on average, older uh, demographic. You know, GM has, you know, a lot more new hires, and so, you know, these deals were much better and much easier to sell at GM than they were at Ford and Stellantis. But in all of this, I, I, do, I have not observed, but I would be happy to say I don't have enough um, connections in the places where these conversations are happening. I haven't observed any organized attempt to replicate <coughs> what, has, what happened in the UAW. Um, you know, there was a significant organizing effort to elect fame that took 
place over quite a long time. Like, as you pointed out, like in the, we have an opening, we had an opening in, uh, after the, the Diaz scandal for an election, but the, the organizing that happened in that election didn't come from the bottom. There were no kind of rank and file candidates that were like, okay, here's our opportunity. We're not gonna have a, um, you know, a, a, a person kind of anointed by the administration caucus to be the next leader. Uh, we could, this is now our chance. That didn't emerge. Now, that was before Fain, but nonetheless, it was an opening that wasn't taken. And I don't think that much has changed. And I, I actually think like this kind of anger and discontent that that is not organized is dangerous because um, those energies can go in lots of different directions, left wing and right wing. Um, and so I think that the effect has been to create discontent, but it hasn't necessarily generated um, a, an organized effort to transform the union from within, I would argue. Do you I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't look at budgets like we didn't look at the we didn't look at that level of like what the what the what the budgets are of the union. I mean, I think one thing to say is that you know when Unifor was created in in 2013, it I mean it it, it and it still is the biggest public or private sector union in Canada, um, but it was created out of two unions that were experiencing massive membership loss, right? The CEP also was, was bleeding members, and that was the, one of the rationales for the merger in the first place. Um, and I think, you know, despite that, you know, it still is a union that has significant resources. Um, but you're right, a big part of why auto workers continue to be, I think, politically central in the union overall is because they do contribute such a significant part of the due share, um, but it is changing. Um, but I'm not sure that the m amount of money necessarily has anything to do with effectiveness in organizing, because a lot of money was set aside from 2013 on for organizing. And in the first 10 <coughs> years of Unifor's existence, they grew by, what, 10,000 members? So 5% of the union's budget is a lot of money for 10,000 workers. Now, to be fair, there's job loss and you know that you have to organize a lot to compensate for, but I think it's, it's, it's not just about not having the resources. I think the resources were there for those campaigns, and I think those <coughs> campaigns, um, and Larry in particular has written about some of these campaigns, in, for instance, in the Niagara casinos, um, where a lot of money was spent, um, and five five attempts that have were unsuccessful, <coughs> and so I think it's really more about strategy uh, than it is about about resources, although resources are important. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's quite clear the union that has not reached its goal to become a union for everyone, which was the slogan when Unifor was created uh, in 2013. And auto as a component of the union is uh, less significant numerically, but somehow they still seem to punch well above their weight. It's sort of media coverage, auto s still seems to get uh, much more coverage than other segments of the union. And uh, I think just uh, the, the, we can't discount the history of the union in highlighting auto as being strategically, uh, strategically important. I wanted to circle back though this question about um, the union, this rise of right wing populism. I mean, to give the union its due, I think Unifor's leadership certainly sees itself as being part of a bulwark against the the, the expansion of right-wing populism, and I think the union is doing uh, and saying things that demonstrate that. But we thought a lot about the structure of the union when we wrote this book, because I think 
a, a, a simple analysis might be, you know, top down bad, bottom up good, right? That's a, a very common formulation on the left. But you know, there are some things in the history of the union where the top down structure led to way more progressive outcomes. On things like gun control, for example, the leadership was bound and determined that the union would take a position against gun control, even though members, rank and file members at the CAW Council, were strongly in opposition. Things like same sex marriage, for example, where there was some. Um, rank and file opposition, but the leadership kind of put its apparatus in place to really drive these things home. So it can work both ways, right? You can have a centralized structure that works for good and a centralized structure where uh, it does, it's not working for good. And I think that we really do touch on this issue in particular when we talk about the Diaz scandal and why in, in a way, you know, who leads the union matters because of the centralized structure uh, and uh, the emphasis they, that they want to put on, on particular campaigns, uh, particular issues, without discounting how uh, members themselves can use the structure to further uh, particular ends. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't see a lot of rank and file, uh, autonomous rank and file activity, period. In, and I think it, it, that is true in a lot of unions, but I don't see, uh, I don't see a lot of autonomous rank and file activity. There's, there's activity, but I think usually the union leadership is involved in shaping it. And those, some of those things are good. Like, you know, they're trumpeting this week this really important legislative breakthrough in Nova Scotia around intimate partner violence that was, you know, that Unifor was very centrally involved in getting uh, passed. Like, so they're doing stuff like that. But um, I think that, you know, partly, maybe to, to kind of pull on a little bit on what, what Larry just said is that, you know, the CW has always been very centralized, even in the days where we were quite admiring of it. Um, it was a very centralized union even then, albeit there were sp maybe spaces for more debate and discussion or there was more of a culture of debate and discussion. Um, but I think that its centralization was not uh, seen as, in the, as problematic because the people who occupied the leadership roles tended to be quite progressive. And it, but it matters because when they are less progressive, or it, then there isn't the capacity of the rank and file to counter those tendencies. At the same time, we shouldn't assume that the rank and file is always more progressive. And like there's a dynamic here that, like there's a, an assumption that if, for instance, we went to one member, one vote, we would get progressive leaders. It's not, it's not so. I mean, Maybe Sean uh, O'Brien in the Teamsters is a good example of that, right? They have one member, one vote, and and we're and we're going to live through some pretty interesting uh, uh, politics because of of that, right? So it's it, it's the 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 relationship between leaders and members is much more complicated than leaders bad, members good, and I think um, you know hopefully we try to do we try to show that complexity in the book um, and uh, but I do think that that a union that over relies on the center for its politics its strategy etc is running some significant risks when things go bad there's nothing to there's very little then to counter those bad things and I think and and the relationship I think between the leadership and the membership has atrophied in important ways uh, over time because the members aren't really actors or seen as an important source of power in the same way. And therefore, they're kind of left to their own devices. And, and, I, and I, I very much agree with what you said, Karen, that in that, in, in that light, when, when people are kind of left to their own devices, there are other forces that are very emotionally compelling that provide them with an alternative narrative of 
what their problems are and how to solve it. And I'm sure that Unifor leadership is troubled by it, uh, but maybe doesn't, has not, like many other unions, has, does, has not the structures, practices, ways of thinking that allow them to reconnect with the members and provide them with a real alternative, um, like alternative <coughs> vision or hope that uh, they could satisfy their needs through left wing rather than right wing politics. Okay, well, I think we have to leave it there. So, another round of applause for